it's my pleasure to introduce Matthias Olsen. See, I got the name right that time. Matthias Olsen, who is, as you can see on his screen, is, is Campfire Stories. Uh, Matthias started this up a few years ago, I think, or certainly was had thoughts about it years ago um, when realising that things were not as you felt they should be in life and wanted to do something about it. And Campfire Stories is how he does this, how he affects change in, in the world and in us. So if I just uh, hand over to Matthias now, and he, we're going to watch uh, one of his movies, um, hopefully a sneak peek of his new one that comes out next month. And then we'll have questions at the end if people want to put them into the uh, into the chat. That'd be great. Thanks, Matthias. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah. Matthias Olson is my name. Um, uh, I'm a filmmaker and podcast producer um, uh, for this platform that I call Campfire Stories. Um, and the way the, the name for the platform came about was I imagined that I was about to leave the old story behind, um, the story of uh, separation and, uh, and and like head out on a, like put on my hiking shoes and, uh, and heading out into the world uh, towards hopefully something that I imagined might be called the story of interbeing. Um, so I imagined hiking off into the mountains and not really knowing whether I was heading in the, the right direction, not having a map, not really knowing anything about the destination, just with some, some, some thoughts about um, dreams that I had for the, for the destination. Uh, and then stopping at one point, looking back and seeing the smog hang, hanging over the world that I had left behind. And then just realizing that it doesn't matter that I don't have a map. It doesn't matter if I'm walking in circles, not really knowing where I'm going. I'm still heading in the right direction. Um, and then I imagined that I would meet other people um, who were on their hike towards something different and uh, that we would maybe sit down for a chat around the campfire. So this meeting here today represents that kind of a thing where I imagine a lot of people on this call um, or a lot of people who are listening to this maybe have had a feeling through their lives that things are not really the way they're supposed to be and, and trying to look for another way to, to live their life. Uh, and so this is sort of a, a little bit of a campfire gathering, uh, albeit a, a digital one. So. Uh, I'm just going to see if I can switch. I have a big picture of myself on the screen. It's like making me nervous. It's looking at me, like demanding that I say something brilliant. I'm switching to gallery view. All right, that's better. Um, so I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, how, like how I reached this point where I wanted to do something different with filmmaking uh, and podcast producing. And then I will show a film and talk to more and show a clip and then we'll do some questions towards the end. If there's, I hope there's time. We'll see how this goes. Um, but yeah, so going back to my childhood, I uh, had a, a very strong feeling that something was off in the world. Uh, maybe not in my first three, four, five, six years, but then later when I was um, starting school and getting to be a little bit older, I just had this sense that like, this is not the way we're supposed to be living. Um, and obviously back then as a child, I didn't have the, the words to intellectualize it or, or make suggestions. It was more of a feeling in, in my stomach or in my soul or somewhere in my body that it just didn't feel right that the way we were living. If I had had the words for it, maybe it would have been something along these lines, like, how come um, wait, I'm here. People, there's like interruption going on, I think. I don't know if you all heard that, but all right, let me try again. So um, if I had had the words for it, maybe it would have been something like, um, how come I'm not part of uh, sowing and uh, producing and harvesting the food that I'm eating? 
uh, how come I don't even know where the food I'm eating comes from? If I, it just you pick it up at the supermarket and it's there in plastic. Uh, how come there's not like an intergenerational living situation going on where I have uh, people that are older than me and much older than me and younger than me running around all the time? Um, uh, in short, I might have said, how come we act as if the earth belongs to humans and not the other way around? Uh, but yeah, being uh, six, seven, eight, nine, 14, 18, and so on. Um, yeah, you, you are part of your surroundings. And when nobody seems to be asking those types of questions, uh, you adapt, or I adapted. Um, so instead of asking those questions, I did what the adults around me told me that I should do, which was to do OK in school. Um, and to get a job and to think about my life and where I would live and whether I wanted to live in a, an apartment or a house and stuff like that. Um, so I uh, got through school, even though, I, I mean, school could have been really, really exciting. Take a, a topic like um, history, for example, where, I mean, history, if you, if you pose history as how did things come to be the way they are? That's an amazing topic to, to wonder about um, in, in, in school or, or outside of school. Um, but history, I don't know about your educations where you all went to school, but uh, in my case, it was all about learning the year of whatever battle or king or emperor. Uh, it wasn't really about asking foundational questions about humanity and, and why we have uh, why we are where we are today and, and how did we get here to the brink of ecological collapse. Uh, that would have been a fantastic topic. It could have been interweaved with uh, philosophy and uh, the kids could have been taught to, to ask really interesting questions. And then the class could have been that we all sit together and, and think about possible solutions. Uh, but instead it seems to me, at least in my years of going to school, it seemed like school was all about so here is the like here are all the correct answers and now we're going to try to get from a b c d and on to getting you to these answers that are pre-written over here um but yeah that wasn't the case so um getting through school doing okay uh but still i i didn't really want a, like a real job so i felt that uh, maybe photography was something that i could get into um, so when it came time to, to choose the um, gymnasium, which I don't know what the equivalent is in the UK, but like the after ninth grade, like the, when you're 16, 17, 18 years old. Um, so I, there was a program for uh, people who wanted to become photographers. And I was strongly discouraged by the, um, what's that person called who um, tells you like, this is what you're good at. This is the, your, your career path, sort of a career advisor. They, I was called into their office and um, uh, scolded basically for making the wrong choice. I was applying for this photography path. Um, and I was like, but I mean, I, I'm the one who get to make that call. You're not the one to tell me. I was all like nervous and sweaty. And, but um, yeah, I held my ground. And so I studied photography and um, ended up uh, leaving Sweden. I moved to New York when I was 22, uh, ended up working as a um, photo assistant for um, five years, and then as a photographer for another, I was living there for 13 years altogether, so another eight years as a photographer. Um, and then I fell in love with filmmaking. Uh, it happened during a film festival organized by the Human Rights Watch and I just thought it was amazing to, to be able to sit there in the, in the front row and watch all these films and having the directors come to the screenings and you can raise your hand and ask questions. And I was like, this is what I want to be doing. Um, and I moved back to Sweden. I went to film school and that was in 2007. And then from about 2007 until 2017, I started filmmaking and then not for all that. The first two years I studied filmmaking and then I became film producer and I produced uh, four, five films for Swedish national television and 
and did the whole sort of film festival thing where you travel around and show your work and everything. But then something was shifting in me and the old questions from my childhood started stirring in me again. The, the like things are not, things don't seem to be the way they should be in our world. Um, because basically I had, I had shut that down from, I'd say from the age of probably 12, 13, and until I was maybe 35, 40, it was pretty much shut down and I was like doing the, the program, doing what you were supposed to be doing. Uh, but then it got awakened again. And I guess like be, being awakened, if I'm allowed to use that term, um, can, ha can happen through many different ways. For me, I think it was just like a dripping of different pieces of things that didn't seem right. Uh, and suddenly like your, the glass just filled up. Uh, and then for me, what, what made the glass spill over was uh, literature in my case. I came across a book and then another book and then a third book. And those three books really changed my life. And maybe, maybe I'm giving those three books uh, too much credit. Maybe it's just all those little drops beforehand. Um, but I, I like the, those books. So I'll, I'll continue to give them credit. I actually have them here. Um, they are the first one that really screwed with my mind. It's called The Ascent of Humanity. I don't know if uh, anybody, probably some people on this call know about um, Charles Eisenstein. Uh, I thought it was a, like a history, like look at our great civilization type book, look at what we've achieved kind of thing, but uh, it wasn't. Um, it's basically a book that asks the question, how did we, how did things become the way they are? Uh, and another book that asks that same question, how did things become the way they are? It's not, this is my Ishmael, is, which is the sequel, but it was the the one that's just called Ishmael is the first one. I don't know if some of you have read that, but um, it's also a, an incredible book that, that asks, how did we get here? Like what, basically that history class that I was talking about that I wished that that was what history was during school. Um, and then a third book, which has the most brilliant title ever. Uh, it's a book by Chalice Glendening. Uh, and the book is called my name is Chalice, and I'm in recovery from Western civilization. Oh. And so for me, I read those three books in, this, in the span of a few months, and um, it, it just turned inside out and upside down a lot of things in my life. And the most um, obvious and big change that happened was that I was living in, the, in Stockholm, in, in the city uh, with my girlfriend. And so the, the biggest thing that happened was that we moved to the countryside, almost like, like I think I was in the middle of the ascent of humanity and then the, just, I don't know in, in which chapter, but somewhere in the middle of it, I was like, we need to be living in a way that when we open the door, we're in nature, part of nature. We need to be living in a way where if we open the windows, we will have fresh air coming to the room. Uh, we need to be living in a way where we can see the stars and the moon and, uh, uh, and have the opportunity to, to put our hands in the soil and, and start growing some vegetables. Um, and so that's five years ago now that we moved to the countryside and uh, becoming quite the farm, I would say. Uh, I'm very proud of my uh, tomatoes and uh, cucumbers and uh, carrots and everything else. Uh, we didn't know anything about this stuff. We were just like looking at YouTube clips and trying to not screw things up too badly and um but now five years into it we're, we're doing pretty well and uh, we're actually going to get a hen house is the latest thing so we're going to add some some, uh, some hens on the rooster to the little mini farm um so that was the, the big change but then i also started thinking what is it that i want to be doing as far as uh, work because eight hours a day or however long you work 40 hours a week you're at work, so you might as well be doing something that, that feels right, like from the bottom of your soul. And I was already doing making films, documentary films, and I loved making films. But what I didn't love was um, 
like what being in the film industry did to me. It made me feel competition with my peers. Uh, it made me feel uh, like longing for um, the prestigious aspects of filmmaking, like longing for like being on a stage and having people cheer at me and saying, you are good, Matthias, you're okay, you're good. Um, and I was like really looking, uh, taking a, a deeper look at myself and, and asking, what is it that I serve? Is it like having people cheer me? Is that what I serve? Uh, I was done with that. Uh, and I wanted to make films where, where the idea that um, the world belongs to the humans it, it is turned upside down, where, where you can think that we belong to the world, we're part of this ecosystem. Um, and that's when the, uh, the Campfire Stories idea came about, like I didn't want to be like Matthias Olsen, the filmmaker anymore, uh, I wanted to be the the campfire stories, uh, whatever the person that, that, that could um, make films and podcast episodes asking those types of questions. Uh, and that's what I served, uh, to sort of try and push the, the cultural understanding of who we are in this world, in this time, in this particular time, um, like the story of who are we and where are we going. I think the story, as like Charles Eisenstein puts it in, in The Ascent of Humanity, he says, or in everything he does, he talks about um, the, the story of separation, that we imagine ourselves to be separated from each other and separated from nature. Uh, and that he talks about that he thinks we're heading towards the, the age of interbeing. Uh, and that's really where I want to be heading with my films too. So to really push the understanding of um, who we are and what we're doing and, and, and make something positive from that. So the first few films that I made were, um, we're gonna watch one of the very first films that I made. Um, uh, actually, maybe we'll watch the film now and, and then I'll talk a bit more because now I've lost it here a little bit. So that'll be good for me to get a 10 minute breather and you can watch a film and then we can pick it up. Um, after that, so I'm gonna hopefully Richard is somewhere. He's the technological wizard who might be on the call somewhere, and I'm hoping that if I say let's watch the film, that that will happen. We'll see. Jag tror det finns en gemensam rot till alla kriser vi nu står inför. Att krig, miljöförstöring, 
psykisk ohälsa, ojämlikhet, rasism, våldtäkt, missbruk och girighet. Att de alla har samma ursprung. Jag har läst någonstans att den anatomiskt moderna människan har funnits i ungefär 200 000 år. Men jag tror inte sett att folk levde då, innan eran av civilisation ledde till den typen av problem vi har idag. Jag tror att fröet till våra nuvarande kriser började gro när vi gick från att vara jägare och samlare till att bli bofasta jordbrukare. Något som hände för ungefär 10 000 år sedan. Det finns ju människor som fortfarande lever som jägare och samlare. Även om de inte är många. Men, så såvitt jag förstår, verkar dessa naturfolk inte leva på ett sätt som leder till samhällelig kollaps. Som vi gör. De verkar leva i rätt bra balans med sin omgivning. Det måste hänt något i samband med att vi blev jordbrukare. Det var första gången idén om att mark kunde ägas dök upp. Folk började bygga staket runt sitt land och började begära av marken att den skulle producera mat. Plötsligt var världen indelad i gröda och ogräs, tamt och vilt. Det som var innanför staketet och det som var utanför. En innovationsutveckling och en befolkningsexplosion påbörjade sin mullrande färd. Den exponentiella tillväxtkurvan fick sin början. Som förvisso lett till fantastiska upptäckter och en nästan obegriplig utveckling. Men en bieffekt är att vi har utvecklat ett nytt sätt att se på oss själva. Ett synsätt som gör det inte bara möjligt- utan även helt rationellt.
att såga ner en hel skog. Alla organismer på denna planeten lever som att vi alla är sammanlänkade. Alla utom människan. Jag gör i alla fall inte det. Jag lever som om jag vore separat från resten av naturen och från människorna omkring mig. Jag står liksom höjd över naturen. Naturen är bara kanvasen mitt liv utspelar sig på. Eller på sin höjd något jag ger mig ut i ibland för att plocka svamp eller paddla kanot. Detta förvrängda synsätt är priset jag fått betala för att bo i ett uppvärmt hus med mjuka madrasser, tv-apparat och ett kylskåp fullt med mat. Priset vi kollektivt kommer få betala, om inget grundläggande förändras, är att vår civilisation kommer gå under. Om vi inte snart kommer ihåg det som alla visste för 10 000 år sedan. Och som alla överlevande naturfolk runt om i världen fortfarande vet. Och som jag hoppas att våra barn intuitivt kommer ha lättare att förstå än vad jag haft. Detta att vi alla är en del av samma ekosystem. Att vi alla är sammanlänkade med varandra. Och med varenda dagmask, elefant och forsande flod. Att tro det går att separera en människas mående från en annans. Eller från dagmaskens, elefantens eller flodens mående. Eller att separera en nations välfärd. Från de kringliggande nationernas. Det tillhör det tankesätt som genomsyrat detta människans sista kapitel av vansinne. Och det kapitlet är nu på väg att ta slut. I'm sorry for the, I don't know if the quality was good on your end, on mine. It's, it's always, as a filmmaker, it's difficult to watch something where you see the resolution, it's all pixelated. 
but you can go to uh, all of these films, I should say, you can go and watch at Campfire Stories and I prepared a little sound for those who want to can go here. Uh, we'll put that, we'll put that in different places that you can find it too, but, or you can just search for Campfire Stories, which will come up. Um, so this film is, like I said before, this is one of the first films that I made uh, for Campfire Stories. And um, I would say there's three foundational films that I made before moving on, because now my films are not as, they're more um, solutions oriented or like, oh, let's look into this topic and try to find solutions moving forward. Uh, but the three films that are sort of of this pace and of this sort of philosophical nature um, are, so this one that we watched, and then I would say one film called On Fear, which in which I question my, like, I asked the question to myself, what stands between me and the things that I know I could and should be doing in order to, to uh, help create a more beautiful world? Um, and so I came to the conclusion that there's a lot of fear in whenever you make, trying to make a shift, uh, at least for me, there's a lot of fear blocking, fear of the unknown. Um, so that's in that film on fear, I imagine myself on my own deathbed looking back upon my life um, imagining or thinking what, what will I have um, like what will I what do I want to tell my younger self what do I want to tell my 40 year old self my 45 year old self um, from my deathbed and then trying to take that the, that advice and because now is when I'm 49 I'm actually 49 but now is when I'm in the middle of life and I'm of a lot of privilege i have this uh there's food in my fridge and and um, and i have the privilege of, of working with something that i love doing so what do i want to do with that um so that's another one and then the third one which i would call like a foundational campfire stories film is called an unlearning uh, and it's a film where i actually meet so you've guessed by now that uh, charles eisenstein is one of my big gurus i've mentioned his name a few times already um, and in that film I actually get to meet him it turned out that uh, just a couple of years after I had moved to this uh, small town where I live now I heard that Charles Eisenstein was coming here to this small town in Sweden like in the middle of nowhere to give a speech uh, or to be part of um, yeah something giving a talk and so I uh, I was like I have to be there I have to meet this person so in that film I meet him and we sit down in my kitchen and have a a little back and forth about life and philosophy and, and the future. So those three are like part of the foundation. And then, uh, like I said, lately I've been making more films of the nature of like, what can we, what can we do? What are some practical things? Um, actually, I just made one. I, I make little films for YouTube also, where I don't like spend so much time with them. It's more like shoot it and then edit and get it out. Uh, and I just made one where, uh, because I started biking to work and, and I ended up selling my car, I got this uh, electrical bike. So I made a film about that. Like, what does it feel like to bike to work for a year? So that's very hands-on practical um, stuff. Uh, I made one film last year called A Tale from the Woods, which is about, which is about um, uh, clear cutting. It's basically a, a cry to the world to stop clear cutting. Uh, we can still have a forestry industry. We just don't take down all the trees at once because that's very bad for the uh, um, for the atmosphere, for the carbon dioxide that gets released into the atmosphere, and it's very bad for the animals that used to live in that. It's just very bad. It's ugly firing. It's just you all understand what that's like. Um, so yeah, I made that, and then. I made one film recently on a topic that was really, really hard for me. Um, <clears throat> it's a film, it's called Fertility Awareness. So it's basically a film about sex. I, I'm of the generation, I guess, where my parents never talked to me about sex at all. And uh, so I was like, left to figure that stuff out for myself. Uh, and now I have teenage kids. And um, so I, I just don't want to carry that on to the next generation where 
you don't talk about that kind of stuff. And so in that film, I meet a, a, a wonderful person who is a fertility awareness, I don't know what's that title, fertility awareness coach, I think. And um, yeah, we basically talk, talk sex for half an hour, which, which is a little cringy, but uh, you can watch that if you like. It's called F Fertility Awareness. Um, and uh, right now I'm working on the, the next release, which is on um, regenerative agriculture. The film is called Into the Soil. And in it, I follow uh, this wonderful uh, farmer. Her name is Bridget, and she's from Ireland. And, but she moved to Sweden. She lives just a few kilometers from my house. And um, I thought I would show a little bit of a clip from that. And after that, if there are any questions, we can do a little bit of Q&A. Uh, and if there are no questions, then maybe I'll come up with something else to say. But uh, Richard, let's see if we can roll that teaser clip from uh, the film Into the Soil. Hello, everybody. This is Matthias Olson from Campfire Stories. This is my editing room. Um, I thought I would invite you for a little sneak peek of the next film coming out. Um, the title of the film is Into the Soil. It is a film on um, regenerative agriculture, on biodynamic farming, and on uh, food fermenting, uh, lacto-fermenting of food. Um, and I'm just putting the finishing touches on the editing. Uh, it's a little bit rough still, there's no music in it, it hasn't been audio mixed. Um, it hasn't been graded, like it's, it's still a little bit rough, but it's coming together very nicely. So I thought I would show you a little bit of uh, the film. Um, so we're going to take a look at a clip of Bridget when she is uh, talking about the lacto-fermenting um, of uh, vegetables. So let's have a look. So right now she is preparing to uh, ferment uh, some green beans. Green beans, yeah. So let's Let's look in and let's listen to Bridget as she talks about this passion of hers. It's a part of the natural world which humans in the recent past have been incredibly afraid of, even though we're always surrounded by bacteria and mushrooms and viruses and everything but we've become obsessively afraid of it. And fermentation is a very quick way to move away from that fear. Like you leave food on surfaces at room temperature for days or weeks or even months, and then you eat it without heating it or doing anything else. It's completely different. And now I've started making cheese and that actually was pushing my boundaries. <laughs> I made cheese and I made this shelf because I have a friend who's a cheesemaker in Ireland, Vincenzo. And then they went moldy. Like, I mean, really, really moldy. Like, there was colors. First there was white and then a bit of green, but there was also black and there was pink. <laughs> and I sent a picture to him and I was like, no, it's too far. And he's like, no, I just cut off the, the outside. It's probably delicious. <laughs> and I almost didn't. I almost was like, this is... I've reached my <laughs> limit, but it was amazing. It was totally delicious. <laughs> but um, yeah, what was I trying to say? I can't remember, got lost in the cheese. All right, so that was a little bit uh, of a clip. The film uh, will be half an hour long and it's going to come out on April 20th of 2021. So that means that if you're watching this clip after April 20th, 2021. You can just head to Campfire Stories and see the film. And if you're watching this before, you're gonna have to wait for a little bit longer. Um, that's it. I will continue editing. So see you guys later, bye. Um, final thought before we see if there's a, a question or two. Um, 
my absolute favorite way to reach out to people is with a newsletter that I do whenever there's a new film or podcast episode coming out. So if anybody uh, on this uh, conference thought that any of this sounded interesting, um, it could be a great thing to go onto the website, campfire-stories.org, and uh, sign up. There's a, in the menu, there's an option for a newsletter, and sign up there. That way you, you get an email whenever there's a new podcast episode coming out or new film coming out. All right. Let's see if, I think, Stephen, are you? Yeah, there you are. Let's see if there's any. Hi. Yeah, that's really good. Really enjoyed that, Matthias. And I think everyone else did because we had some really nice uh, responses, like from someone who said they loved the, the you know, the, the full movie, um, the first one, but they loved the slowness and the depth of the movie, and that it was they found it was a wonderful and powerful film, and very profound. So, I guess that they're, they're really good, you know, um, good statements to have. I guess they're the sort of thing you're looking for. Um, I can Someone say just else. one short thing about that. Sorry, yeah, go on. About, about the slowness. It, that mm -hmm. is part of my activism. The, mm -hmm. the, obviously, the, the choice of topic is always part of my activism, but mm -hmm. also the way that I tend to let the films be a little bit slower than usual, because we all know that from the invention of film mm -hmm. up until today, it's just been faster and faster paced. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, I'm trying to reverse that a little bit. Absolutely. No, that, that was good. That was good. It was certainly very atmospheric, I suppose you could say as well. You know, the the whole thing leading up to the the realization of um, things are wrong. And um, I think the 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 clip from the new one was very good as well. The uh, the fermentation and the and the cheese <laughs> that was that was good. Um, I think it's good also in these days of uh, the Corona pandemic it's uh, interesting to have a, a different take on yeah. bacteria yeah 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 and mm. i think in in this country it's growing more the um probiotics and things like that certainly are more appreciated um one thing could you put the name of your first film in the chat somebody was asking that they missed the name the first the one Which on you, the, your first film that you yeah yeah do it like this Interactive slides. <laughs> yeah, on fear. Yeah. Use my handwriting. Yeah, yeah, on fear. Thank on you. Fear. And then the other one was the one with Charles Eisenstein. Yeah. This is probably not the best way to do it, like these that's slides. Okay. This that was from Misha. So I hope um, that's okay for you, Misha. Um, so Rachel was saying that. That she thinks you've formed a film collective. Could is that right? If you could speak a bit about it. The idea initially with Campfire Stories was that it would be a platform where filmmakers from around the world with similar similar ideas could come together, mm -hmm. and um, it would be like sort of a Netflix of alternative ideas. Um, but then it just I'm trying to follow what feels right. And it hasn't been going in that direction. I've been trying a little bit to have guest filmmakers come and, and, and release films. Um, but mm. also I've found that there already are excellent such libraries, um, mm. such as Films for Action is an incredible one. Um, and there's one uh, Australian one, Uplift mm. TV, and there's probably other ones. So I just, it, it's turning into more of a, it's, it's my films for now. Mm. And it's more instead of trying to be a Netflix with thousands of titles, I'm trying to be just my films with just maybe 15 <laughs> titles, so as to not confuse yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. Some people um, like a small bookstore, you know, with just yeah, just yeah, books, sure. selected books. Some people like to go to the Amazon thing with tens of millions of people. Mm. So, um, uh, another question was asking: um, Are your films shown on Swedish TV to be seen by? general audiences at all or is it just on your site the campfire stories so before i started campfire stories i made four films uh, that were uh, co-produced with swedish television and shown mm. on swedish television and um, i have since i started campfire stories i've made one of my titles which is a co-production with swedish television uh, which 
I made it with the Swedish voiceover for the Swedish mm -hmm. audience, and then we made an English version uh, for Campfire Stories. So that's available in both. And that's actually beautiful. It's called, if I may say so myself, beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called, um, um, uh, God, I dropped the name here. It'll come back to me in a second. You know, it's, okay. it's, it's all portraits. It's all about the, the question of the film is, what is it like to be mm. you? What is it like to be the other? What is it like to be Donald Trump even? Or what is it like to be mm. a racist? Or what is, what is it like to be the other? What are the mm. underlying uh, factors of that person's life that has turned that person into who they are? Doesn't mean you agree with what they're saying, but asking the question, what is it like to be you? means that uh, you, you have some understanding of where they come from and then bridges can be built mm. uh, on compassion is the title oh great on, on compassion i know i've done i'd watched the first film uh, that we on uh, a few nights ago but uh, i noticed a few titles there and i'm going to have to go back and <laughs> start having a look at as well i think we're about at the end of our session now um, everyone's saying they it sounds really interesting. They love your work, so good. Keep on doing it, and it's glad you didn't take the advice of your careers advisor all and those years ago. Or yeah. I would have been, I would have had a real job. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> heaven forbid. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you, so, thank you all for inviting me here. Thank you to to this for this. It's been a pleasure. Industry. It's been a pleasure, really.